welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Johannesburg. The issue of nationalization has surfaced again in mainstream debates in South Africa in the run-up to South Africa's 2014 general elections. Now, much of that debate is being driven by the media's reaction to Julius Malema's new political party, the Economic Freedom Fighters. The Economic Freedom Fighters are calling for the nationalization of South Africa's mines and banks. Now, the nationalization debate is not a new debate here in South Africa. While nationalization is not a policy of the ruling party in South Africa, it certainly was something that the ANC called for way back in 1955 when it drafted its Freedom Charter. And despite the troubles currently being faced by Trade Union Federation COSATU, nationalization of the mines is also something that COSATU has been talking about for the last few years, showing support for it. More recently, Metal Workers Union NUMSA, very much in the contested alliance politics spotlight, has also become more vocal about nationalizing South Africa's mines. Why is nationalization such a perennial topic for discussion in South Africa? Well, if the Marikana massacre has shown us anything, it's that the mining sector remains largely untransformed. Despite our government's policy of black economic empowerment, Ownership of South Africa's mines is still very concentrated in a few hands and the model for extracting natural resources is still very much based on apartheid era labor practices where huge numbers of poor black men are still engaged in a migrant labor system in the mining industry where they earn very poor wages. So how can we turn the situation around? What can we do in South Africa such that we arrive at a situation that the extraction of mineral resources in this country actually benefits the widest variety of South Africans in the country. To help us answer this question, we're talking to Duma Kubule. Duma is a black economic empowerment expert in South Africa. He knows a lot about the mining industry and he's going to bring his formidable knowledge to bear on this debate um, on nationalization in South Africa. Thanks so much for joining us today, Duma. What I wanted you to sketch for us first is kind of give us a sense of uh, the mining sector in South Africa. What is the status of it at the moment? What are the kind of key natural resources that South Africa has? Uh, which are the mining companies operating in the country and, you know, what are the mining um, ownership patterns in the country? Thank you. Um, the starting point about the mining industry as to why the debate on nationalization will never go away is that mining is an industry like no other industry. I'll explain what I mean. The value of the mineral resources in the ground is $4.7 trillion. It was valued two years ago by a company called Eco Partners. Now, that figure is almost double the previous estimate that was done by Citibank of $2.5 trillion. Now, Eco Partners has criticized that valuation as very conservative, and they've come up with a figure of $4.7 trillion. Now, what that means is that the value of these mineral resources is 1 million rands per citizen of South Africa. Now, the most important thing in this debate we should remember is that the mineral resources under the ground do not belong to the companies that mine it. They belong to South, Africa, South African people. In most countries in the world, the fact that you have a mineral resource under your garden does not mean that you own it. Um, so that is in the custody of the state. So because it is publicly owned, unlike a restaurant or a construction company or any other industry, it must generate additional returns for us as a country in addition to normal tax resources. So let me just explain this a bit more. Um, our mining industry, um, w when you extract the minerals from the ground, you're making all of us as South Africans poorer. So the companies that extract the minerals must compensate us as a country for making us poorer. So that's why we have other systems of taxes in the mining industry that you don't find in other industries. So, so that is for me is the key issue that people should remember that the mineral resources do not belong to the multinationals that mine it. Um, it belongs to us as South Africans and it is our right to get a fair share of the returns from the mining. You ask the question, it, just summarize our industry. We've got platinum, we've got coal, 
And um, I think those are the, and iron ore. Those are the three major um, minerals that we have in South Africa. Um, pl coal, platinum, sometimes coal is bigger than platinum and depending on the year, but those are three main minerals. Now, in terms of the companies, there's about 20 large companies that account for 90% of production. In iron ore, there's one company that accounts for 40% of production. So it's a very um, monopolized industry amongst very few players. In platinum, there's three players that you all know about in South Africa right now. So there's about 20 companies that extract the majority of our mineral resources. On the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the value of these companies, I think, is about 2 trillion um, rands. And these are multinational companies um, that have assets throughout the world, in Africa and the rest of the world. So the portion of the market capitalization that refers to South African assets, uh, thumb, roughly a half of that two trillion relates to South African assets. So we might be talking about a trillion rands depending on the value of the stock exchange. Now within that, as South Africa, we, we, we came up with a new Mineral Resources Development Act in 2002. Now, what the state did is to say that we will cancel all the licenses that you previously had. We're going to start new rules. Now, the new rules was that we will give you the license if you can prove that you can do X, Y, Z in terms of empowering, the, um, empowering South Africans, um, black South Africans, historically disadvantaged South Africans in the, in the case of the mining industry. Now, the headline uh, demand was for 25% ownership by black people and by the year 2014, which is this year. And quite sadly, we have not, we have not reached anywhere near um, that um, figure. Now, just to unpack um, in broad what terms. What have we reached? OK, in broad terms, what I'll say is that um, the figure that we did a few years ago hasn't really changed. The value of the assets, I think, is about 5 of the 1.8 trillion. It's about 5% of the JSC's market capitalization is owned by those by the, black comp by the black companies. But if you strip out the foreign assets, you come to a figure of about 8% um, of the JSE is uh, black, of, of South African mining assets are black owned. Now of that 8% or the 5%, whichever way you want to look at it, 66% is owned by three companies. The three companies are African Rainbow Minerals with roughly give or take 20 billion rands. Um, two, second is um, Impala Platinum. It's um, owned by the Bafokeng tribe, um, and they, they, um, it's a long story of a vision of an African leader um, chief a hundred years ago who, who, it took a long time for them to earn this ownership, it's got nothing to do, very little to do with the government's policy. And the third one is Exaro, which was a company that was set up by Anglo-American uh, to escape um, competitive issues. So they are mostly in coal. Um, African Rainbow Minerals is a diversified company, and Exaro is a, is, I'm sorry, the, the Bafokeng are in platinum mostly. Um, so those are, that is the situation. Now what I argue about is that, let's start, is that enough? What we've learned now is that what we have done in terms of our mineral policy, I do not believe enough. There are huge gaps in terms of the, the policy that we have, the Mineral Resources Development Act. The first thing is that, um, let's start with the whole issue of tax. The industry um, paid about, I think in the State of the Nation address, Jacob, the president said it was about 20 billion rands in taxes. That is 0.1% of um, total state revenue. Now, if you look at the mineral endowment, which is 4.7 trillion rand, and then you look at the taxes that are paid 20 billion rand, I would argue it's a pittance in terms of the return that we're getting as a country. And you shouldn't really count the tax because this industry should be generating in addition to normal tax revenue that applies to other industries. So what the situation is, we also have royalties, which I think they generate about 5 billion rand, and I would argue that we still have to do more. What we're seeing in local communities is many local communities are complaining about the lack of benefit of this um, industry for the local people, and also the employees are complaining about the lack of benefit for employees. So uh, my argument is that we have, to, uh, we have to tear up this Mineral Resource Development Act. It's under review currently, and there's a few principles that we have to put into this uh, new act as we review this charter in 2014. So this discussion is very timely. I think we made a, dis a wrong decision to ma make the only requirement black empowerment because black empowerment is 
is a policy that applies to all companies in South Africa. It shouldn't be anything specific to the mining industry. So I would argue that the mining industry must do more than black empowerment. Now, so what I'm trying to say is that the other thing is that the benchmark for black empowerment in the mining industry is much, much lower than the rest of the economy for reasons that I won't even explain. But the mining industry has achieved very little in terms of black empowerment. For example, if you look at employment equity, um, the, we've done an analysis of all sectors of the economy. It, in fact, is done by the Employment Equity Commission. And um, it shows that mining is consistently the worst performer in terms of employment equity. Um, and um, most companies in South Africa, even the ones that are not transformed, managed to achieve a lot in terms of black representation in junior management. The mining industry can't even achieve that. I looked at the figures on um, Abbott, added basic education and training. About half of the industry, of the people in the industry, they are functionally illiterate. Um, in the mining in industry. In the mining industry, yeah. Um, they're below Abbott level four. But the industry, the last time we looked, they'd only trained about 6,000 people to the level of Abbott level four. And how many people roughly are employed in the mining in the, sector? In the mining sector, it's about, I think it's about 400,000 people. About half of them don't, um, half of them are functionally literate. They haven't reached Abbott level four. And only 6,000 of them have been trained by the industry. That was when we did our research a few years ago. So those are the figures that when you see um, Marikana, you begin to understand why the people are, the majority of the workers in Marikana will never ever be in junior management. So it just, that's just giving me, so the main thing, I, with the mistake about the black empowerment policy that we made is to say it is enough to just give 25% to black people. And I argue that is not enough. And the reason I say it's not enough is that this is a publicly owned asset. It should benefit everyone. By definition, a black empowerment transaction or whatever, however you say it, will benefit a few black people. So there has to be more that to take from this industry for the country as a whole. So I would argue in terms of what we've learned over the last 10 years of this Mining Resource Development Act, as we tear it up, as we should, is that the certain things that we should do. In that 25% black ownership portion, we should stipulate targets for employees and targets for communities. So, um, what I would say is that 10% must be for employees, or a certain percentage, a fixed percent must be for employees, and a certain fixed percent must be for communities. That's number one. So it, it can't be just amongst the black business consortium. It must benefit the local communities as well. So the second thing I would say is that we have to have a state portion of that as well, in addition to the 25%. So I would argue that it should be about 25% as well, the state portion, what you take back on behalf of the people of South Africa. And that is what I'm arguing at the moment here. And what about people that work in the mining sector themselves? Yes. I mean, um, post Marikana, there's been lots of industrial action in the mining industry, mm -hmm. um, people demanding higher wages. What are your views on that? Okay, what I've just said is that I think a portion should be kept for the employees as share ownership schemes, but it's not a solution. But um, the thing when I looked into the whole issue of the mining industry is that wages um, account for about 18% of the total industry cost. So I think it's a bit simplistic when you want to cut costs um, to just look at wages when there's another 82, is it 82% that has got nothing to do with wages the cost structures. I think as a country, as a resource country, we have to have a view on the exchange rate um, because um, a resource country has to have a weaker exchange rate. And generally what happens in resource countries is that um, there's a lot of uh, capital that comes into the country, um, into the resource sector, and it results in an overvalued exchange rate. So what we need to do, I think our system of um, monetary policy as a country is archaic. We have one tool, which is the interest rate, and one target, which is the inflation rate. But the best practice amongst developing countries is to use um, multiple tools and multiple targets for monetary policy. So I think that we have to have a discussion because the wage, when you say something is not affordable, you're talking about a particular, at a particular exchange rate. And what we've seen right recently is that the exchange rate has depreciated, so it should have, in theory, made things a bit easier for people to bear the costs that they're having, but um, the Reserve Bank has now started to increase interest rates, which is another effect, yeah, yeah. Without justification, I may add, yeah. 
So you've talked about what you think um, we should be doing here in South Africa, but can you talk to us a little bit about international experiences? Yeah. What's best practice in other parts of the world where countries have formidable natural resources? Okay, I would, I would say I've done a lot of case studies, I think about 12 countries throughout the world um, over the past few years. And I think the South African situation is really, uh, let me just put it this way. Outside of um, the Anglo-Saxon countries, England, United States, um, Australia, and Canada, um, state ownership is the norm. 88% um, of oil is owned by national oil companies. It is not owned by Shell and BP. It's owned by the national oil companies in Mexico, in Saudi Arabia, in Venezuela, and so on. So it is, I would say, in mining, the figure is about, I can't remember, it's about 30% in mining or less than 30% in terms of state ownership. So I would argue that state ownership outside of the Anglo-Saxon world is the norm throughout the world. And we should start talking about now. In terms of getting the benefits for the people, there are many models. Okay. There are royalties, there are production sharing contracts, there are state ownership. And what I would like to say is that what we did in South Africa, you can't put state ownership off the table as a mean of extracting rent from the industry, off the table, because state ownership is more effective than taxes in terms of extracting rent for the people. And uh, there are examples of that. For example, in Chile, they have a mixed model where the state copper company, Codelco, owns 30% of the copper industry, and all the multinationals own 70% of the industry. But Codelco, with 30% of the in industry generates far more in terms of resources than the 70, the 10 leading companies, 70% of production put together. And that is just an example of how efficient uh, state ownership. So Chile, in a way, is getting the best of both worlds mm -hmm. in terms of their model of state ownership. And if you had to ask me, I would think that for South Africa, we should be following a similar model. But there are extremes. There is Mexico, where 100% of every oil, there is no, for 75 years, since 1938, when they nationalized their oil industry until December last year, for 75 years, um, there was no foreign participation anywhere in the oil industry. So Mexico is an extreme example of 100% state ownership and everything flows to the people of Mexico. Yeah. So there's, there's different models in between the extremes of Mexico. And um, we should talk about countries like Venezuela, Venezuela, there's still quite a bit of public participation, and um, there's a big myth about Venezuela that it was nationalized by Mr. Hugo Chavez, but that is not the case. It was nationalized in 1971, the industry, and it is very popular in terms of um, state ownership. So there are various models in many countries around this year. But nationalization is not a policy of our ruling government. And going forward, what are your views in terms of what you think that their position would be? I think the current review of the mining charter is an opportune moment to uh, re revisit this debate. And I, I have to say this to you, um, the whole issue of state ownership of natural resources, it will never ever go away. In many of these countries that I did case studies on, for example, Venezuela discovered um, oil in 1917. I can guarantee you every year for the past 100 years, it is a major issue in their national election. And throughout the 100 years of having oil, it was, they went from one extreme of uh, free enterprise and everybody uh, towards state ownership and something in between. And in all the countries with, with natural resources, it's a debate that happens in every single election in these countries. Yeah. So I don't think that the debate has happened in the ANC at Manga, was it um, in Bloemfontein? Um, it's the end of the matter. I do think South Africans from all walk of life must be demanding public benefit for this mineral this mining industry. Yeah. Duma Kubure, thank you very much for joining us at Saxis. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you to our viewers and listeners for joining us at Saxis. And remember, if you want more social justice news and analysis, you can get that at saxis.org.za.